Welcome to tonight's presentation of Y-DNA and Genetic Genealogy. This is a presentation of the Southwest Ohio DNA Interest Group, and your presenter this evening is Kathy Reed. So what is Y-DNA? Each of us inherits 23 sets of chromosomes, one set from each parent. Chromosomes 1 to 22 are known as autosomal chromosomes, which means that they are non-sex chromosomes. Autosomal DNA is found in the nucleus. Y DNA is one of the two human sex chromosomes. The other is referred to as an X chromosome. Females are XX, getting one X chromosome from their mother and one X chromosome from their father. Males are XY, getting one X chromosome from their mother and Y chromosomes from their father. Therefore, only males can take a Y DNA test. Females do not have a Y to be tested. Here's the image that we typically see of the 22 pairs of autosomal chromosomes and the two sex chromosomes, which are the 23rd pair. The female sex chromosome is an X chromosome and the male sex chromosome is referred to as Y chromosome. Again, females are XX, receiving one from their mother and one X from their father, whereas males receive an X chromosome from their mother and a Y chromosome from their father. In the male, the 23rd pair of chromosomes contains an X chromosome inherited from the mother and a Y from the father. And because the Y chromosome is non-recombinant, it is handed down by a father only to his sons. This makes the Y chromosome great for tracing the exclusively male line of a family, and it makes it useful for surname studies, something we're going to demonstrate a little bit later in this talk. This shows how the Y chromosome is passed down the line from father to son to grandson, great-grandson, etc. If you notice, the Y chromosome is not passed on to any daughters. So how big is the Y chromosome? It's made up of approximately 59 million base pairs. The Y chromosome contains about 200 genes, and of these genes, at least 72 of them code for proteins. The gene that is responsible for the initiation of male sex development in humans is called the SRY gene. Who was chromosomal Adam? If all men could trace their lineage all the way back, it would merge on a single person referred to as Y chromosomal atom. It does not mean that there was only one Homo sapiens male alive on the planet at the time. Y chromosomal atom may have had thousands of male contemporaries, but over time, each of the other lines died out because it did not produce a son who reproduced a son. Maybe you've heard of the expression, daughter out. What does that mean? Well, let's imagine that a man has three daughters. None of them can take a Y DNA test. They would have to find a brother, father, or uncle to test who carries the Y DNA of interest. It's important to remember that you can either move forward or backwards in your family tree to identify a potential candidate. Although there is no limit as to how far you can go back, you must realize that the further back you go, the greater the possibility of having misattributed parentage. In other words, you're probably more certain if you're dealing with two or three generations, that there has not been a non 
paternity event. As you go back further, just statistically, you would expect that somewhere along the line, there may be a non-paternity event or what we commonly refer to as misattributed parentage. So you wouldn't have the correct Y DNA to test. It's just something to keep in mind. One of the most important things you need to do is determine who to test. And in this example, whose Y DNA did the three grandsons inherit? Well, we've got a couple here referred to as RJH and KHR. The two of them were parents of a girl who later married a guy. And the two of them went on to have three sons. So the question is, can you get Y DNA from any one of the three sons? Well, let's look at this. Since RJH, the father, only had a girl, he could not pass his Y DNA on to a son. On the other hand, the spouse of EHV, in this case referred to as IRV, had three sons and they all inherited his Y DNA, not the Y DNA of the grandfather. Here's an example of doddering out. Let's say in this uh, made up couple here, again with RJH and KRHR, that instead of having three sons, couple had three daughters. What would EHV have to do to find out about the Y DNA in her family? What about her three daughters? Well, that presents us with an interesting dilemma because she can't order up a Y DNA test herself. She doesn't have any Y DNA. Her three daughters do not have Y DNA. So if she wants to find out Y DNA is for her father, RJH, she would have to either agree to get him tested or if he was not available to be tested, she would have to go further up in the family line to identify possibly a grandfather or a nephew, a grandson of the grandfather who would carry that Y DNA and test them. So what's the current thinking on Y chromosomal Adam? We do not know when Adam lived. Scientists believe that Adam lived between 200,000 and 300,000 years ago. That's quite a span of 100,000 years. We believe that Adam probably lived in Africa. And predictions regarding when Adam lived are based on our current understanding about the mutation rate of DNA. It would have taken 200,000 to 300,000 years for the mutations observed today to have occurred. It's important to remember that Y DNA timeline estimates are not fixed in time. As recently as 2012, a new haplogroup was discovered among African American test takers. This new route, identified as A00, pushed back the date for the previous Y chromosome atom. And there's new research being done all the time that could change our estimate of when Y chromosome Adam actually lived. So how is a Y DNA test used in genetic genealogy? A Y DNA test can be used to either confirm or reject a relationship on the direct paternal line. The test can also identify potential matches. There could be a predominant surname in identified matches. I'll show you a little bit later that often if you join a surname group and you combine the Y DNA results for several test takers that share the same haplogroup, then you're going to find out often that there is a predominant surname within that group. Once a potential surname is identified, the test taker could research the origins of the surname. For example, is it a Welsh surname, a German surname? 
you can determine where your haplogroup fits on the Y-DNA haplogroup tree. I know I've used that term haplogroup a couple times without defining it, but I will a little bit later in this presentation. So what specifically is analyzed with a Y-DNA test? Well, specific locations referred to as markers are chosen for analysis and comparison. Test prices are based on the number of markers analyzed. When I first had a Y-DNA test done on my brother back in about 2006, I believe, you only got a 12 marker test then. Since then, they moved to 25 markers and then 37, 67, or 111 markers. Now 37 markers is considered to be a basic Y-DNA test. And the reason for that is that with a 37 marker test, you have a 95% probability of having a common ancestor within seven generations. Markers fewer than 37 would give us a common ancestor that could potentially extend back beyond what we refer to as the genealogical time frame. So it's much, much harder to connect. Where can you buy a test? Well, currently, ftDNA or FamilyTreeDNA.com is the main provider of Y-DNA tests. This is a sample of what the test costs by the number of markers. ftDNA has the advantage of storing the samples and upgrades can be purchased later. A couple of minutes ago, I told you that I started out with a 12 marker test. Later, I had them reevaluate the Y-DNA with a 25 marker test, and then a 37 marker test. And now I'm up to 67 markers. I'm gonna stop there for a while because I haven't found anyone that matches my Y-DNA or my brother's Y-DNA at the 37 marker range. If they don't match at 37, they're not gonna match at 67. So I don't need to go any further than that at this point. 23andMe and Living DNA do a high level Y-DNA analysis as part of their autosomal test. The analysis will allow for the identification of the male haplogroup. A haplogroup is defined as a group of individuals who share several genetic mutations, as well as a common, usually ancient, common ancestor. You can get the male haplogroup assigned by either 23andMe and living DNA. It's just not gonna be as detailed going to be a broader haplogroup that could be broken down later with a more specific test, as we'll see. When you order up a Y-DNA test, the first one you would take is what is referred to as an STR test. And that STR stands for short tandem repeats. An STR is a segment of DNA in which a short sequence of nucleotides is repeated. You all know that there are basically four chemicals that make up our DNA. We refer to them as A, C, T, and G. When you take a strand of Y DNA and analyze it, often there are what we refer to as repeats. And the number of repetitions is called the allele value for that marker, or simply the value, with each marker having a characteristic range of values. Although STRs on both autosomal and Y-DNA, only Y-DNA is used for genetic genealogy. The set of values of an individual's Y-STR markers is called his Y-DNA haplogroup. One of the things about Y-STRs is that we know they have a slow mutation rate. They can be used to determine whether two males have a common ancestor through their exclusive male lines. As the YSTR is handed down from father to son, 
the YSTR can experience a mutation that changes the number of repeats. If a father has 10 repeats on a YSTR, a son may have nine or 11 on the same marker. We'll talk about that a little bit later too. There's going to be some variation over time. And that's what we refer to as genetic distance. But it's not going to be significant if it's a close relationship. A comparison of the markers helps determine an individual's haplotype. And closely related individuals have similar haplotype. If it, we look at the example below, you can see that there's a pattern here. CTC, 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 and CTC. That CTC repeats itself four times. So it's designated with a marker value of four. Here's another example. You get a report that actually seems a little bit incomprehensible at first. And this, these are literally the kinds of results you get with a Y DNA test. On the first row, we have something labeled DYS, which stands for DNA Y chromosome single copy sequence. So this gives us a location uh, within the strand of Y DNA, and that's referred to as the marker. The alleles, again, are the number of repeats. So in the example right underneath the table, if we look, we start out with TGT, but then it changes to GTT, 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 and if we count the number of repeats there for GTT, we can see that it's repeated 12 times. In this example, the sequence is on position DYS426. So if you look at the table above where it's circled, you can see that the location of the marker is referred to as 426. And within that location, there are 12 repeats. Someone with a result of seven at DYS426 would have the following sequence. GTT, GTT, GTT. Notice there that the repeat is seven versus a repeat for another sample of 12. So here are some results of a 67 marker Y DNA test. You can imagine my excitement the first time I paid for a Y DNA test and got results like this. For instance, the first row, that's what I purchased originally. Panel one is on 12 markers. It gives me the locations of those 12 markers. And then the value again is the number of repeats. And I have to wonder why that's important. Why would I have paid money to get a report that looks like this? And with 67 markers, it's more of the same with the number of repeats and I had no idea how that was going to help me out with my genealogy. We will understand it in the next few slides. So when you get your DNA results from FTDNA, this is what the home page looks like. And it says, welcome to my FTDNA. To the right, we can see that it lists our haplogroup as RM269. The maternal haplogroup is listed as H. H, you should understand, is the most common haplogroup in West, for Western Europeans, and it's broken down several times from there. But this was a Y DNA test, and it used to be that they named the results of your haplogroup. It used to be that haplogroups were identified with a very long code that got to be a bit unwieldy. So a few years ago, FTDNA changed the haplogroup designation using what is referred to as the terminal SNP. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes too. So you get a page that looks like this, and as you can see, you can click on matches, ancestral origins, 
a picture of what the haploid tree looks like and maps where people with the sharing that haplogroup may live. They also have migration maps and a few of the categories are still under development. Your YSTR results are similar to the page that I showed in the previous slide. And you can print your own certificate that lists all of those results. In this case, I clicked on the Y-DNA matches box. I did it for 25 markers. Now, for the most part, uh, the smallest test you would order has 37 markers. Distance, which refers to how closely the matches are related. And it'll list 25 per page, and you can run the report. When I ran the report, I got something that looked like this. I can tell that this first person, Richard, took a Y-DNA test with 111 markers. So did Philip. And James took a 67-marker test. You can also see that Harold took a 37-marker test, and Sean took a 67-marker test. If I look over here, you can see that all of these matches fall within the RM269 haplogroup. Customers are asked to list the earliest known ancestor that they're aware of through their genealogical research. And in this case, I see some real common surnames here, just with different spelling variations. We have Tally, Tolly, Tally, Tolly again, and their spouses and where they, where they indicated that they lived, and if they had the information they had the names of the spouse listed there, too. In this final column, you can see the date when these matches were determined. We're going to talk about what this TIP, or TIP box, means. Okay, TIP stands for a calculator indicating a time predictor. And that provides an estimate, again, the emphasis is on the word estimate, of the genetic distance between two people. The software actually takes into account the known mutation rates of the tested markers. Different markers have different mutation rates. So I ran this particular report comparing two people. If you notice, they had 37 markers. Daniel William Jones was compared to Mrs. K. Clark. Obviously, it's not her Y-DNA. It's someone whose Y-DNA she had tested. You can choose the number of generations you want to compare, and you can calculate it, or you can change some of the parameters and recalculate it. These are the results I got. Comparing these two people listed below, within four generations, there's a 58.51% chance that Daniel William and Mary Kay share a common ancestor. Within eight generations, it goes up to 88.74%. So you can see that there's a good chance uh, that at least almost an 89% chance that these two individuals share a common ancestor within eight generations. And then it keeps on going up. The problem is it's rare for us to have genealogical research that goes back that far. This is an example of the migration map. This is where the latest science shows that Adam probably came from, somewhere in Africa. And then the Y-DNA groups broke apart over time. You can see this R group split into R1 and R1A and R1B, and that both of these subgroups populated much of what we think of as being Western Europe. This is an example of a phylogenetic tree of Y-DNA haplogroups. If you notice, and you start at the top, and, and I have the link there, you can see that this particular table came from Wikipedia. And it discusses the naming conventions that have been used to identify haplogroups. So we start out at the top with Y chromosome atom. 
then that tree was basically broke apart into haplogroup A, then B, and if you notice, all the haplogroups are generally assigned in alphabetical order. Now, if you recall, my haplogroup was haplogroup R, all the way down here in the bottom, which means, just if you consider the alphabet, that it's a much more recent haplogroup than some of the others in the list. Then R is further subdivided as we go on. We'll show that in a minute. So what are those naming conventions? Y DNA haplogroups are defined by the presence of a series of Y DNA SNP markers. Subclades are identified by a terminal SNP. The SNP furthest down in the Y chromosome phylogenetic tree. So let's try to define what a terminal SNP looks like. Here's an example. It says here that my confirmed haplogroup, or the haplogroup of my brother, is RM269. And if you look at the table here, I'm going to show you a broad copy of the table first. You can see here's RM269. That can be further subdivided into smaller and smaller groups. And each one of these groups are identified with what is referred to as the terminal SNP. It's the last SNP in a group of SNPs and that's how we identify each one of these groups. It's a little bit abstract and you need to read about it to really understand it. And I was, would suggest some of the sources that are listed within this PowerPoint are also referring to a book such as Blaine Bettinger's book that we often discuss and read the chapter on Y-DNA. It says at the top of this that so haplogroup RM269 is the dominant lineage in all of Western Europe today. It also has low frequencies in Turkey and the Northern Fertile Crescent, while its highest frequencies are in Western Europe. So what do the STR repeats indicate? The number of repeats determines the degree of the relationship. Repeats change over time, but men who are closely related have the exact same number of repeats or similar repeats. The greater the differences in the number of repeats, the more distant the relationship. And that's where we come up with this term genetic distance. Genetic distance is a numerical representation of the differences or mutations between two individuals. And I will show you a specific example of that. If the difference is less than 10% of the total markers tested, the match is probably significant. So this is an exact example of what can happen with a surname project. In this case, I have Wainwrights in my family tree. And we were trying to figure out if four families, one from California, one from Chicago, Illinois, one from Florida, and one from Cincinnati were related. We knew from our genealogical research that all of us had Wainwrights who at one time lived in Cincinnati, Ohio. One branch of the family spelled the name with two W's, my particular branch, had dropped that second W, and they were known just as Wainwrights, W-A-I-N-R-I-G-H-T. So in order to prove that these families were related, we had to identify male candidates who were willing to have their Y DNA tested and submitted to this particular DNA project. Within FTDNA, you can often find a project with your surname. And these are all run by volunteers. The volunteer will take your Y DNA results, upload them, and try to group them together. 
So in this particular case, these are the families that I was interested in. And first of all, they're grouped together because they all share the same haplogroup designation, RM269, with 269 being the terminal SNP. If we look at what the people who submitted their DNA knew about their earliest ancestors, there's a Thomas in 1620 New Jersey, another Thomas in 1766 New Hampshire, a Tom in 1620, which I assume is the same one as the first one listed, a James from Pitt County, North Carolina, 1760, another Thomas from New Jersey in 1647, looks like he could be a son, and also a Thomas Wainwright born 1620, dying 1683. Uh, at least three of these people seem to have identified the same common ancestor in this list. So let's look at their results. First of all, you can see that all of the markers are listed here at the top of the graph. And then if you come down here, well, one of the things you can see is the minimum, the maximum, and the mode for each one of these submissions. So if I look over here, you can see that this person here only had 12 markers tested. And in all cases, every one of these people shared the same 12 markers. That means they were related at least at one time. They had to have had a common ancestor, but it could have been way earlier than the common genealogical time frame. So other people went on and had their DNA analyzed up to 25 markers, and that's what this looks like. Well, now you can see that some of them were highlighted in purple and some in pink. So what does that mean? Remember that I told you that a father could pass on his DNA to a son, and it could be off a little bit. The copying could be off. Instead of, like in this example, 19 repeats, it could be 18. It's one down. As we come over here, instead of 30, it's 29. Over here, we went up one from 14 to 15 and 15 to 16. But you can see, for the most part, these people share a lot of Y DNA in common. When we get over here, you can see a few more variations the further out that we get. So you can actually look at this. If you recall in a previous slide, let me go back to it. If the difference is less than 10% of the total markers tested, the match is probably significant. So if we look at this, and we look at a 37 marker test here, we can see 10% uh, of 37 would be 3.7 markers. So if we look at these rows again, each one of these in comparison to the minimum the maximum and the mode, they're not that far off. And if I count the number of differences, like here's one, two, three, four, well, we said 3.7 would be 10%. Here's the second one is one, two, three. The third one is one, two. The fourth one is one, two. So that is a clear indication that each one of these submitters are related. Because of this Y-DNA test, we were able to reliably confirm what we thought we knew from the paper trail, that all of the branches of these particular Wainwrights did share a common ancestor. So you've got your results, and how can you use them? Well, in the example I just discussed, case one, my great-grandfather was named Britton Wainwright. I had connected over the years with a Wainwright, different spelling in California, who had Wainwrights who lived in Cincinnati. He had a known second cousin, also a Wainwright with two W's, living in Chicago. And through an autosomal DNA test, I found a cousin here in Cincinnati, Deb Wainwright Pearson. 
We wanted to see if all four of these family branches were related. Notice that Deb's maiden name was Wainwright. We couldn't get Y DNA from her, even though she and I matched on an autosomal test. Through our paper trail, we were able to figure out that my great-great-grandfather, Britton Wainwright, and her great-great-grandfather at one time owned a blacksmith shop here in Cincinnati together. They were brothers. So, I am a Jones. My brother's DNA would not help with this. I could not rely on my brother's DNA to answer this question. So, we got other people within this group to find a, an appropriate male to test. And then the group administrator placed everyone within the same haplogroup, RM269. And as I discussed before, you can see on this chart where there was a difference, higher or lower from the mode. We had a male from California to test, a male from Chicago who agreed to test. My cousin Deb, and I knew I was related to her, even though I Emma Jones, because we matched on an autosomal test, and she was able to convince her brother down in Florida to test so that we could answer this question. And now we can conclude safely that all four of these families had a common ancestor. Here's the second case. A new cousin contacted me a few months ago to say that she felt we shared a common great-great-grandfather named Alexander Jones. I was not able to prove the relationship through traditional genealogy. It's especially difficult when you are working with a Jones surname. So if you notice my great-great-grandfather, I'd been able to prove him through traditional genealogy. Alexander was a Jones. I was a Jones. Her maiden name was Jones, and she was insisting that we shared the same great-great-grandfather. So I asked her to send me all of her paper research, and right away I saw, thought I saw a flaw in it, because the death certificate for her great-grandfather listed the father as William. And so right away I said, this doesn't make sense. Alexander did have a William, but there's a mistake. And so I was reluctant to accept her conclusion. The thing is, I know from doing genealogy for many years that one of the most unreliable pieces of information in regard to a relationship can be the death certificate. The informant may not have the correct information. William was, in fact, a brother to her deceased great-grandfather, and Alexander had died when her great-grandfather was very young. So it's possible the person providing the information listed the older brother versus the father who had been dead for many years. But I just can't jump and make that conclusion. This girl was persistent, though. I, I love her spirit. In order to try to prove it, she had several people tested in her family. You can see the relationships to me listed here. And as they used a variety of companies, but we were able to put them all on GEDmatch. And as you can see, not only was every one of her relatives related to her, but they were also related to me and every one of my siblings, cousins, it was amazing. There was definitely a relationship there. But we still were not able to prove that Alexander was our shared great-grandfather. The only way we could do that was to use a Y DNA test. Here's a picture of Alexander. He died at the age of 43 here in Cincinnati. He lived from 1820 to 1863. I know he is my great-great-grandfather. She suspects that he is hers. So the only way we can know for sure is to confirm it with Y-DNA. So let's look at some examples. This is a family tree 
that includes some, but not all, of the ancestors and descendants of my father, John Jones. We start with Alexander. Alexander, we know we had one, two, three, four, five children. Elizabeth, Johnny, Martha, William, and Charles. Johnny was in my cousin's family line. Charles was in mine. So let's look at Charles. Charles got married and had three children, Edith, Leo, and Charles. My grandfather had five children, Charles, Edith, my father, John, Margaret, and Robert. And then if you look at the bottom row, these were all of John's children, seven of them, including me here. Okay, so this is what we knew for my side of the family, the descendants of and the ancestors of John Jones, linking us back up to Alexander. This new cousin, on the other hand, said, I have evidence that this Johnny Jones, Charles' brother, is my great-grandfather. So let me show you what her tentative tree looked like. Now, remember that not all of these listings are absolutely correct. Some of the names have been changed because the tree would have been so big. But let's go back to Alexander. She said, my great-grandfather is Johnny. Johnny had three kids, Charles, Earl, and Harley. Moving down, Harley had two children, Harold and Ruth. And I've listed four of Harold's children, a Bonnie, David, Lawrence, and Mary. All right, how did the Y DNA go down through this family tree? It went from Alexander to Johnny to any one of these three boys, but since we're talking about this new cousin, Harley is the person that we want to follow to Harold. And Harold had her mother, Bonnie. But Bonnie doesn't help because she doesn't have any Y DNA. If we want to check out this relationship with Y DNA, she has to convince her uncle David or her uncle Lawrence to be tested. And one of the two has died, so then we have to look at their sons, which in fact they both have. So there are seven candidates with the Y DNA of Alexander Jones. In my family, there's Tom, Tim, Ted, Dan, and Don, and I already have Dan's DNA. In her family, there's a Lawrence and a David. So without a paper trail, there's no other way to prove that Alexander is our common great-great-grandfather without doing a DNA test. So let's look at this sample and decide, in this theoretical example, who we would need to test. We have a couple at the top here who've passed their DNA down to their children, then there's grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And the great-grandchildren are numbered here. I want to give credit to Blaine Bettinger and Debbie Parker Wayne, who developed this particular example and included it in, in their latest workbook. All right, the question is again, who in this row has the Y DNA of this gentleman at the top? Well, let's look at this row. First, he had a daughter. We can eliminate everybody in this group because he did not pass his Y DNA on to a daughter. So both one and two are not candidates. If we look at this second example, he had a son. The son got married, had a daughter. The DNA stopped with him. So even the fact that she later had sons, number three did not get the Y DNA of her father, he got it from his father. So we can eliminate candidate three. The third pairing, he also had another son here who had both a son and a daughter. 
Well, we can eliminate number six because, again, that's a daughter. And any boys would have had to get their Y DNA from her husband. But back over here, if we look at this couple, this couple had a daughter who married someone and a son who married someone. Number five, in fact, has the Y DNA that he inherited if we look along this path. So number five is one candidate. We've already eliminated candidate number six. Let's look at this couple. They had a son. That son had a son. So that's candidate number seven. He also would carry the Y DNA. And finally, if we look at this final cat, the couple, they had a son. The son got married and had daughters and a son. So number nine also would carry the Y DNA of this original contributor at the top of the example. So I've used the term SNP, and what does SNP mean? Well, SNP stands for Single Nucleotide Polymorphism. Our DNA is made up of hundreds of thousands of nucleotides that are designated A, T, C, and G. And these nucleotides are located along the length of the Y chromosome. We use them to determine someone's haplogroup or deep ancestry, going back thousands of years. This is the kind of test that is used when you're talking about the haplogroup tree that was pictured earlier. It's SNP testing. So what is SNP testing, and should you do it? I've included in here a fantastic link to a blog post that was written on the DNA Explained Genetic Genealogy page, and you should really take the chance to find this article. Even though it was written in 2012, it's relevant to that. You can read it and understand whether or not you want to go that extra step and spend the money to take a SNP test. Now, I want you to know that until you've taken a 111 marker test that tests the number of STRs, those repeats, you're not even eligible to take a SNP test. So you've invested quite a bit of money in it, even getting to this point. And then, to me, this is the kind of test that what I refer to as genealogical nerds would buy because it's really not going to help you to determine a common ancestor. Here's a summary of the differences between the two types of tests. STR testing is based on the number of repeats and can provide a good estimate of your haplogroup. SNP testing gives you a definitive haplogroup designation. Your haplogroup can always be refined as additional SNPs are identified. So if you can think back to that tree, each branch breaks down further and further and further into subgroups, and the SNP tests are designed to help you determine just what is the terminal SNP, and that is open to being changed as we learn more and more and more, and people take more of these tests. If you want to do a SNP test, they call it the big Y on FTDNA. You can see they had a sale, and it went down to $399 from $649. It tells you in this first column that if you buy this test, it's going to analyze nearly 25,000 known SNPs, placing you deep on the haplotree. tree. It covers 10 million base pairs, more than any other Y-DNA test on the market, and over 500 STR values that can provide a a deeper insight into your paternal lineage. That's what you get. But the main thing to remember is if you take this test, you're making a contribution to the genealogical community 
as we try to uncover additional SNPs and grow the haplotree. So you may not find anything that's particularly useful to you, but the more SNPs we're aware of, the more subbranches we're aware of, or the subclades, the better off we are in the long run of trying to understand how humans spread throughout the planet. So this is the final slide, and I ask the question, I'm so confused, how do I learn more? We've talked about a lot of very abstract concepts, from SNPs to STRs to haplogroups to markers to repeats, and it's a little bit overwhelming to take it in all at once. So if you want to have a better understanding of this, I suggest these sources. There's the ISOG, International Society of Genetic Genealogy page, and they have an article on Y chromosome DNA that you might find very helpful. There's also uh, an article on the human Y chromosome DNA haplogroup that's listed at this link, this particular link links it to Wikipedia in the article that refers to the naming conventions for Y-DNA haplogroups. Finally, I cannot recommend these two books highly enough. Blaine Bettinger is an author on both of them. The first one is The Family Tree Guide to DNA Testing and Genetic Genealogy. And also, he collaborated with Debbie Parker Wayne and they wrote a workbook called Genetic Genealogy in Practice. Both of these books are available through Amazon.com. And so you can check it there and at other places and buy those because I find that I have to have resources like that constantly at my fingertips to review and review how Y-DNA can be helpful to our research. So I hope I haven't left you totally confused that you've found this presentation to be helpful. Next month, we will be dealing with a talk on mitochondrial DNA. Hope to see you then. Thanks for coming.